Greetings, this is Berto, and we're back for another episode of 80 Days as we continue our trip around the world. So we're gonna go to the market, and we're gonna sell this thing for a hefty sum. Which is awesome. Uh, let's see. I don't know if we're gonna still travel that way. One scarf. What's this? This wardrobe. Shaving kit. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, uh, we'll continue on. Let's, uh... <laughs> thank you. Let's stay in a hotel tonight. We took a room and settled in, and I decided to take drastic measures to aid my master. Whatever I gotta do, man. I gotta, he's hating me right now. He put a stethoscope to my master's chest and listened. A mild fever would say two days to recover full strength. There was no alternative. Oh, scar! All the way up to a hundred! Awesome! Alright. Now we have to figure out how to get the hell out of here. I spent a few hours wandering known by the rather ominous name Souk of Darkness because the stalls and lanes are so thickly crowded that sunlight does not penetrate within. As a result, it was a lamplit lamp -lit labyrinth. I felt like Theseus in the Minotaur's labyrinth. Only I had no erudin to guide my way along amongst the various twists and turns. I was, however, in search of a very particular quarry. Pirates! This was, after all, the dreaded pirate coast. I inquired discreetly at an antique stall, which had a variety of expensive, rather scuffed merchandise arranged in tumble piles. Pirates are enemies of the Sheik, the stall owner intoned piously, though he was unable to stop himself from adding a bitter remark, and certainly no excuse for the British to bring their ship and soldiers to our shores. I can hardly... the Sheik's man, I am hardly British. You have an interesting selection. I am hardly British, I exclaimed in front. Mr. Shirley, I have no fallen... I have not fallen so far that you mistake it for an Englishman. I am French. The stall holder rolled his eyes. That is hardly better. Now, my friend, I cannot deny the callous indifference wounded me deeply. I maintained a stoic air. I imagined to offer their man a smile to show I did not take his terrible words to heart. Please, sir, stop smiling. He wrung his hands together, sounding unaccountably uh, quite alarmed. If I tell you about the pirates, would you go away? The stall owner gave me the name of the pirate who supplied the stall with contraband artifacts, an Omani who had converted to Hinduism and made his fortune raiding vessels, traveling the Arabian coast. Captain Balam of the airship Gandivi, even now docked in the port Kobis. Alright, what do we got? Pearl cart arrives today. Arrives Sunday. Merchant ship. It arrives tomorrow. I might do that one actually. Just because it'll get us. Yeah, let's do this one. It's cheaper too. Ah. Okay, we'll stay in a hotel tonight. With the last light of the evening, I washed and hung our linen to better prepare us for our upcoming departure. All right, let's go. Boom! Awesome, we're not gonna lose too much. I'm so glad we got back into 100 with them. Oh, it was an airship. Oh. The Gandiva was a specifically little airship painted bright red and covered in hundreds of dented gold bosses with a flag painted with a flying monkey garland garlanded with flowers fluttering from its mast. Uh, Captain Balaram matched his ship, wearing a heavily embroidered red coat and turban with a jeweled cutlass slung over his white tohiti. A fine ensemble, and one I am not ashamed to admit I envied. Regarding the ship, however, Mr. Fogg's lips thinned slightly in distaste. I shared his concerns. The Gandivi looked as though it lacked any requirements of gentlemanly travel. It probably did not even have a trouser press to its name. Um. 
It was only a day's journey to Dvarka. We dined with the captain in the evening. The captain regaled us with a fanciful tale of how he once saw a giant Norwal in the Arabian Sea and fired a pistol into its eye. What the frick, man? Until you were suddenly interrupted by a siren's wail. Uh... Is it serious? I demanded, leaving the feet. Captain stood up. We are being pursued, he informed us. I am sorry, gentlemen, but our journey may take longer than anticipated. I went down slightly. That's okay. It didn't go down too much. And we're here. In morning light, Mr. Fogg discovered that our pursuer was a girdleless Percival-type British naval ship which changed its attitude to the situation. It appeared that Gandiva acts against British interests, he said, as I heated the water for his morning shave. We have a duty to aid Her Majesty's Navy. He was correct. Let's do it. And we should not ignore a moral obligation because it would be inconvenient. He proposed that we, that is I, should sabotage the Gandiva. Alright. For my assault, I chose... <laughs> assault on the engines. I'm not going to punch the captain. Climbing the rope ladder, stirring to the envelope, and performing something of a miracle with a... A shilling piece. Uh, thrown into the propellers with deadly accuracy, the engines guttered and stalled, and we began to descend. Mr. Pocket, everything in control on the observation deck. Matters moved quickly. Naval officers aboard the Godiva within the hour, arresting the captain and his wife and diverting us to Bombay without so much as a by your leave. And so it was that we arrived in the jewel of the British Empire, the vast domain of India. Oh, sweet. We went all the way to Bombay. That's awesome. Why are they going down? I, I literally did what he asked. Alright. Mr. Fogg cared not a strand straw for the wonders of Bombay, but gave me a few hours' leisure as he sailed to his evening paper. I ended up wheezing and puffing my way up Malabar Hill, the highest point in South Bombay. I paused at the top to look out towards the city. I could see the gas lamps along the Queen's necklace of Marine Drive being lit one by one in preparation for the evening and palm trees waving in the salt-scented breeze. Catching my breath, I found my steps irresistibly drawn towards the Hanging Gardens, which shielded the Parsi Tower of Sounds from the bay. The gardens were magnificent. Little steam-powered curricles and horse-drawn carriages vied for space underneath the shady trees. British S uh, officers escorted their stiff-bodied wives or made eyes at brightly dressed Indian girls, and in the shadow of the gardens I saw the symbol of the copper lily on the door of a converted mansion. I steered clear, finding my way back to Mr. Fogg. We gotta you know, stay 36. I mean, we gotta get moving. I steered uh, through the strong of the busy city. Busy city. All right, let's find some roots. I walked the streets a while, discovering the possibilities of how we might make progress. Yeah, I could take the railway. If we do this, boom, we get right over here. Awesome. Ah, that's fine, let's go. We're taking the railway across India. We went with Sir Francis to Bombay Station to buy our tickets through to Calcutta. The clerk who took our money counted it fastidiously and then recounted it before issuing us a ticket. A ticket to Calcutta, Shahib. Four days, no faster way in the world. And there are no issues, no delays, I inquired seriously. No impediments of any kind? Oh no, Shahib, no, none at all. She gave me an edge smile. I should have known she was lying, but we bore the train in blissful ignorance of our fate. Oh, son of a bitch. The train started with a sharp screech, but entirely punctual. We shared our compartment with Sir Francis, my master made no secret of the circumstances of his journey, and our new friend clearly thought him entirely devoid of common sense. An uncharitable view, which did not endear me to him. Our rager was now in full swing. I began to worry over delays. Uh, 
Yeah, and obstacles, both imagined and real. Mr. Fogg's cool-headed demeanor seemed incroyable and made me admire him all the more. While stiffening my resolve to aid him in winning his uh, wager at any cost, I slept fitfully through the berths were comfortable enough. I had an uneasy feeling about our journey across India. I'm just trying to do whatever I can uh, because this journey is going to really lower how much he likes me. As we can see, it's already going down. Here. There you go. Yeah, I'm great, aren't I? Today, Sir Francis told me of the regions we were passing through. Mr. Fogg, who had not was, was not traveling, but merely describing a circumference, describing a circumference, referred to referred to reading his edition of the Morning Post. Ah, uh, I intend to divert the conversation to a different topic. How safe is our journey? Well, Sir Francis said at length, depending on if we run into the Kali Bhakt. They are devotees of Kali, the red-tongued Hindu goddess of death. Kali. It reminds me of Indiana Jones. I have heard rumors of those these Dovidis who have been the cause of some recent disturbances. What kind of disturbances? Sir Francis sighed deeply. They've been murdering travelers, leaving the corpses on display as a grotesque warning to the British Raj. Uh, have they not been caught? I was indignant that such barbarities were not swiftly dealt with. The Kalis operate in the territory... <laughs> I'm oh, thinking Khaleesi, never mind. Uh, operating the territory of the independent Maharaja of Gwalior, governing by one of the liege rajas who died last month. The rajah's death was the uh, la start of all the trouble. Sir Francis sighed vol voluble again, and we left some comfortable silence for the rest of our journey for that day. Copenhagen bomb threats continue. The train conductor woke us as we passed along the carriages, shouting, Passengers will get out here! Monsieur Frog took me a look, and so I... I determined to find a way to make our journey continue. Though my hopes... Through, though my hopes on that were quickly dashed when I discovered that there was no more track. Apparently, the papers had been somewhat overzealous. The railway was complete, uh, in reporting the railway's completion, the track was altogether missing between Alibab and Calcutta. Sir Francis looked quite ready to knock the conductor flat on his back, though my master betrayed not even the slightest hint of dismay. I asked a fellow passenger, a Portuguese opium merchant, who laughed at my predicament before racing off in her steam carriage. A boy not long out of a short trouser seemed to take pity on us, or at least had a wish to practice his English and directed us to a local merchant who had recently purchased a large mechanical elephant from Bombay. Oh god. Now let's explore. I don't think I want to take a an elephant. Ali Bab was a charming enough town, though not, it was said, a desired destination of ours. Beyond the city limits and between us and our goal lay the forest, Jakarad, populated by tigers, pythons, elephants, and apparently bandits. Mr. Fogg was his usual phlegmatic flegma self, but I could not share his calm. I am a man of cities, not the jungle. Alright, where are we going? A Sunday and cost a buttload of money. And we'll really... I don't know if I can do that. Uh, 12 noon. I'm, I'm losing the same either way. More or less. Alright. Um, spend the night in the hotel. As night fell, I afforded my master every service. I went up, I'm going to go for a walk. Uh, I found a cheerful Punjabi artist who had lost a purse, which I helped to find, and who then, between belts of shouting, told me that you would pick up carved animals in Altair worth a huge amount in Singapore. I paid him a pound for the information. Oh, no market, nothing. Let's just go. At least the valet uh, thing helps. Ah, it's costing so much money. It was easy to spot the Chuni, the mechanical elephant, as she was easily the largest creature, no indeed the structure in Alibad. Her owner's eyes lit with a variance at our approach. My friends, do not make me commit to paper the sum that Monsieur Fogg paid for that elephant. Hmm. 
nearly expired several times over during the negotiation, Mr. Fogg advised me to splash some cool water upon my face to revive myself. All three of us, myself, Mr. Fogg, and Sir Francis mounted onto the iron carriage suspended within the cage of rotating gimbals which comprised her belly. The cage kept the carriage from pitching and rolling. With Chuni's iron-footed gate, like a gyroscope, one could pit perch within. The Manhut scrambled up behind the pachyderm's padded neck, and we set off in a straight line towards Calcutta. We are four hours into the short cut through the Jacquard forest when the Mahout called a halt. A halt. I watched his face, which with utter flail and still the sound of cymbals and bells overlaid with voices raised in chant. The Mahout urged Chun-Mi, Chun-Ni behind some thick foliage and turned off her engine. She slumped into a guttering silence. Through the branches, I saw more than forty men and women in procession. They took the look of rich merchant mercenaries, but they're armed with naked sabers, which they proffered to the priests for blessings. Behind the procession loomed four mechanical Kali with polished black skin, gleaming ruby eyes, and a protruding tongue the color of blood. The earth shook with each of her pistol-driven steps, and a string of bleached skulls around her waist rattled as she clutched a young woman whose head, neck, shoulder, ears, arms, hands, and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems, and whose eyes were thickly colored. Sir Francis looked troubled. I have heard rumors that the Kelly Cuts cult sacrifices virgins. The Mahout shook his head. She is no virgin. That is the widow of the Rajah. She looked very small and frail in the iron arm of the mechanical goddess, but was quickly lost from view. The Mahout had begun to start Chuni's engines when Mr. Frog said, Suppose we save this woman. How exactly? I demanded with some excitement. I see only one course. The project he then outlined was a bold one, not to say impractical. Practical. Mr. Fogg was to risk his life, at least liberty, and therefore the success of the tour to rescue the lady. I was ready for anything. As for my master... I perceived a heart. A soul under his icy exterior for the first time. He decided We decided to wait till the early hours of the morning and spirit the woman away from camp when the mercenaries were asleep. We crept upon the Kali backs as they slumbered in a clearing beside a new ruined temple. There were guards patrolling at each corner of the camp. A stealthy rescue would be impossible. I was seized with a notion to disguise myself as a guard. Together with Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis, we captured a guard whilst he was relieving himself against a tree. His clothes were a loose fit, but serviceable enough in the dim morning light. I stole into the camp with short, careful steps, but could not help triumphant grin as I passed by without attracting undue notice. I found the young prisoner huddled in sleep and reached out to her shoulder to wake her. My dream, my fingers barely pressed her tunic when I felt my legs swept out from under me. I dropped to my knees. Quick as a panther, the woman leapt to her feet and pressed the edge of a gleaming curved blade to my neck. Her lips were drawn into a grin more bloodthirsty than ladylike. Good morning, she said. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. And so we came to be the prisoners, oh my god, of a Kali cult. In the forest of Jacquard, the woman turned out to be the leader rather than the prisoner of the band of mercenaries. They had risen up against the British after the death of her husband. Despite her fierce appearance, she left me my journal and pen. Uh, my documentary efforts seemed to amuse her. And she laughed heartily over the recent entries until she came to this one, featuring herself, her brow wrinkled. We are not a colleague to cult, mister. Erase that. I glanced at the mechanical goddess and the... Uh, Oda waved a bejeweled hand. We believe in the goddess Kali that does not make us a cult. Are all followers of Christ fanatics? Uh, but you are mercenaries, I said, glancing pointingly at her blade. She looked at me with eyes older than her years. We are warriors, and this is a war for freedom, whether we realize it or not. She left me those words, and I moved on to, interro or she moved on to interrogate Mr. Fogg, who was attempting to sit very straight in hempen bounds, as night and fell in the forest upon the possibility of escape from a mercenary brand. I woke to a strange scene. Oda and Mr. Fogg were sitting at the feet of the mechanical goddess, sipping tea and conversing. In so much as Master conversed, I shared a look with Sir Francis, who looked affronted, though that may have simply been the Englishman's thwarted desire for morning tea rather than his moral objection. 
Oda laughed and placed a del uh, delicate hand on my master's elbow. Mon Dieu, she was flirting. This was useful. I resolved to use her distraction to find a way out of the rather unfortunate situation. I enlisted the aid of Sir Francis, who was tied nearby. He was an old India hand, after all, and had seen military service. We made a plan to sham stomach pains and attempts to overpower the guards when they approached. So suffice to say, the only result was a sharp thump with the butt of one of the mercenary's pistols. I slept uneasily, contemplating more drastic actions on the morrow. This is bad. When I awoke, Mr. Fogg and Adu were nowhere to be found. One of the mercenaries took me to a nearby steam stream for a wash, and when I returned, she was standing in the middle of the camp. Mr. Fogg was a few paces behind her, looking as calm and unruffled as ever, though he kept glancing at the window to run eat. Mr. Fogg has explained your circumstances to me. I find your ways your most amusing. We will convey you to Calcutta. I glanced at my master, whose cheeks were simply so, uh, ever so slightly stained with red telltale sign, though I would not be so in depth close to suggesting anything untoward it had occurred between the English uh, gentleman and the ready turned outlaw. The five of us, my master, Sir Francis, the Mahout, Ada, and for myself, mounted the mechanical Kali, who carried us the carried us the with loping grace to the outskirts of Calcutta. I dare not approach the city. Your monarch has a bounty on my head. I hope you write my story as well, Berdo. She had before bestowing a wink upon Mr. Fogg. Good luck. I said nothing. Unable to wish her success against the institutions which my master held dearest, the crown, the empire, and not least the law. We walked the last mile, or so finally wrapping our destination, Calcutta. Oh, well, this, uh, this hurt relations with my master. Okay, well, we're going to stop the episode there. This is a long one. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please click like. If you really enjoyed it, please click subscribe. And we'll see you again next time.